So, Hawk, you know, we had a chance to meet first when you came to a lecture I gave about food. And the first part of my talk was about food injustice and some of the things that I think you heard were kind of surprising to you. Um, and as a result of that talk, you invited me to speak um, at the Riverside Church in Harlem, uh, where Martin Luther King gave his famous Vietnam speech protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, it was one of the most tumbling things I've ever done, and I was so honored to be asked to give a talk. And I talked about food injustice, and I talked about the ways in which our food system is driving uh, obesity, economic strife, poverty, violence, social justice issues, educational challenges, uh, so much more climate change. And, and it was kind of surprising for many people to hear the message that I had. I, there were a lot of gasps, for example, when I said the King Center wouldn't let me show the movie Fed Up because they were funded by Coca-Cola. And this is Martin Luther King. And, and Martin Luther King said that, that our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And, you know, you have a lot of courage because you, you're willing to say things that matter, uh, even if they're not too popular. So um, you have this sort of extraordinary kind of history of dropping out of high school and sort of getting in trouble and sort of finding yourself back to a path that has allowed you to really improve the lives of your community and, and the world in a, in a large way by having a message that is pretty resonant now, which is how do we stand up for what's right in America? How do we stand up for what's right in the world? Um, you really came to national attention when you got up on stage at the mother of all rallies in Washington, D.C., which was basically an alt-right white supremacist rally masquerading as patriotism. Amen. <laughs> and, and they asked you to come up on stage to share your thoughts, which I think you were surprised at. And I think your video had over 50 million views, um, yes. which is pretty amazing. What was that like? And, and what, what went through your mind when you got up on stage? And how did you shift into a message instead of opposition and violence to love? Uh, thanks for having me first. Of all. Yeah, and, welcome. You know, you're my buddy. So <laughs> it's, it's good. It's like we're sitting here talking. Uh, the mother of all rallies was different. It was it was a different uh, animal for me because usually when we go to protests, we raise our voices, we put our fists in the air, we scream our points at people. Here we were at the mother of all rallies, and we're doing this, and they invite us to go up on stage. Usually, it's, <laughs> you know, it's like them screaming back at us, Charlottesville. You got invited to a party you didn't want to go to. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The, 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 the cost of admission was really high, but the, the experience was well worth it. Uh, between the time that they asked me to go up on stage and I arrived on stage, it was really interesting because... It's hard for me to explain this because if people aren't spiritual, if they don't believe in God, then they might not believe in these types of moments. But it was like the sky opened up and God spoke to me and said, make them understand who you are. So instead mm. of going and screaming my point of view at them, I wanted to understand, I wanted them to understand who we were and why we felt like this. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that was out of love but not a soft hug everybody, sing kumbaya love, yeah. but a real tough love, kind of like a motherly love, the yeah. love that allows a mother, a mother of all love. Yes, the mother <laughs> of all love, right? <laughs> so, you know, the, you hear those stories about a mother lifting up a car to save her baby, that type of love, a strong mm -hmm. love. So when I said, I started out by saying, I'm an American, they went bananas. Like they couldn't believe it. Oh my God, Black Lives Matter. They're happy to be American. Yeah, I was born here. <laughs> you know, my ancestors built it for free. Yeah. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? I'm vested. That's like, right. I'm vested. This is home. And I explained that as Americans, we have the built, we see problems, we mobilize and fix them. So when we see a man like Eric Garner, who screams for his, you know, for air, who says, I can't breathe 11 times and is choked to death, then we have to do something about that. Right. I said, I'm a Christian and I don't know if your Bible is any different than mine, but it says love your neighbor. And that Bible doesn't say that your neighbor has to be from the constitutional United States of America. Right. So here you have Black Lives Matter. You have immigration issues. You have their core, which is the Constitution in America, their core, which is the Bible. And I'm telling you, like we follow the same God and principles and the way you're approaching life in politics isn't necessarily correct. It's actually borderline evil. 
Some people weren't ready to hear it. I had some hecklers, but others had like this light bulb moment, Yeah, you know, and it went from these two groups that were fighting. A lot of those people, we were like throwing rocks at each other yeah. in Charlottesville. Yeah. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And uh, what was really interesting about Charlottesville was there's a picture of me in the Daily News and I have a sign and a bullhorn. There's a mm-hmm. little bit of blood trickling down my face. Yeah. I was giving a speech and kind of ducking the in, rocks <laughs> the rocks and, and, and water bottles filled with cement and I got tired of it, right? And I said, I, that's it. I'm, that's it. It's on, right? So I go to grab rocks to throw back, right? I devolved. Yeah. Yeah, so to speak. And I ran over to the side and I was looking for something to grab, and a young woman from our group, Nepal, who's 17 years old, she's like, Hawk, you're going to get yourself killed. I'm like, whatever, just hold my ball <laughs> on. You stay over here with it, so safe. And this little white lady came out of nowhere. She had to be like 70 years old. Like, like Mother so Teresa. Peaceful. Yeah, right? And she appeared, <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. And she appeared, and she said, son, you could... Do so much more with your voice than anything you pick out, Mm -hmm. pick up out of these streets to throw. And she was in the back of my mind when I took that stage at the Mother of All Rallies. But since Mm. then, I've made friends across the, uh, you know, I I guess across the political gap, and they're listening now. Uh, Some are mobilizing. I have a friend named Scott Adams. You ever heard of Dilbert, the comic? Yeah, sure. He writes Dilbert. Wow. And he's the coolest guy in the world. We've spoken on the phone a couple of times. He's good. So we're just trying to figure out how to unite people on common ground, how to put down their differences and unite for a cause. Yeah, we're all human first, you know. Amen. Yeah, it just reminds me, I heard this guy speak who was one of the leaders of the white supremacist movement. He was mobilizing people. He was on the media all the time. And he told an extraordinary story where he really believed everything that he said, that he had sort of a factual basis for why whites were superior and blacks and other minorities were not. And he was sort of ostracized. He went to a normal college and was a little bit ostracized. And he met this guy, it was this Jewish guy. And he, this Jewish guy invited him to a Shabbat dinner, like a Friday night Friday you nights, know, yeah. celebration <laughs> Jewish dinner. And he sort of befriended him. and. They would meet on a regular basis. And so this white supremacist was trying to convince him of his point regularly. And yet the the Jewish guy just patiently was presenting him with alternative view of reality, which was based on a different set of facts. Absolutely. And over the course of a year, he completely transformed and almost like he was deprogrammed Mm -hmm. because he lived in this bubble of a world where he didn't know what the other was. And so the other was foreign and bad and dangerous and and yet somebody even like that was able to shift by just communication and by sharing and by human to human contact. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think that's beautiful. There are a lot of stories, uh, that are out there like this. I'm working with a group. I'm actually on the board of a group called one America. It's rabbis, imams, uh, Christian preachers. There's, there's, there's heads of nonprofits and we're all working together and I get it. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I get it is because I've developed this philosophy, like meet people where they are. Mm-hmm. Okay. Don't expect them to be at your level, but go where they are, look at them in the eye and really try and understand their yeah. viewpoint before you assert yeah. your views onto them. Now, question, which person is more dangerous? The white supremacist who's spewing hate or the person who has love in their heart that are good people, either self-proclaimed or not, that aren't doing anything to change the world. That they're silent, right? They're just silent, yeah. Yeah. So I always, I'm always trying to, you know, analyze which one is worse. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm Jewish and I remember, you know, and heard stories of growing up in the Holocaust and, you know, there were people living all around there and they sort of ignored it. They smelled the burning bodies, they saw what was going on, they saw the trains and they just remained silent. Mm -hmm. So how complicit are they right? exactly yeah right yeah so you come by your activism sort of honestly your mom and dad met at a civil rights rally in the 60s right absolutely yeah yes indeed and uh that inspired you uh yes i was born right you spent my birthday with me at riverside church and i they gotta did. say you gave the most powerful speech on that day you know here you are 
tall, handsome Jewish man <laughs> who's standing up there talking about food injustice. And I'd liken your statements to those that Black Panthers made in the, in the past. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Like the gasps were honest. Like I'm an albino panther. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see those, right? <laughs> but um, but no, it's, it's true. And it was it was so righteous and it was so necessary. It, it, it was just needed. But my parents met in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. They had rallied for a African American studies class, and when they implemented the the the, the course, they gave the job to a white teacher. Mm. And they were like, "No, we want someone who's familiar with our experience to come in." So my dad let her walk out. He was outside protesting. My mother looks out the window and he says, "What are you doing in class, girl? Like, you know, come down here." My aunt introduced him, and a few years later, there was there I was. And amazing. So you grew yes, up in the Bronx. Yes, yes, South Bronx, about five blocks from Yankee Stadium. And how was it back then? It was. In the 70s? No, nah, in the 80s. 80s, oh yeah. yeah. All right, 80s, I'm, I'm no. old, you know? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was the height of the crack epidemic, right? So when you see, you remember those commercials about drugs and kids mm -hmm. are like running and their foot would splash in a puddle with like crack vials in it. That was my existence, mm -hmm. right? There was a man shot with a shotgun five times in front of my door, right? I remember I was in the in the room playing Barbie dolls with my cousin. I'm safe in my masculinity. I can say that. <laughs> you know, I was playing. I had a Ken doll. She had a Barbies. We were like, yeah, hey, you had the Ken. It was fine, yeah, I had right? the Ken with the Ferrari <laughs> or the Corvette. All right, well, that's <laughs> right. not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we went to run to the door, and my aunt came swinging around the the, the 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 hallway out of the kitchen and kind of threw us down on the floor in the living room. So there was always violence. Like the first time I saw a pistol in school was the fifth grade. Mm. You know, uh, my friends had, and it was we were coming back from lunch, and I'm like, "What's going on? Y'all look, you know, tense or tough or whatever you want to call it." And he showed me like a nickel plated twenty five. Wow. So life was different, and the problem for me was I was like a little black Cosby kid. Right, mm -hmm. it was poor. Yeah. I had both of my parents. They were both working at the time. They used to dress me like a preppy. Yeah, so penny so, loafers. Oh and my God, I put polo shirts in them. Yeah, khaki <laughs> pants <laughs> with sweaters tied around. Ooh, yeah. the sweater thing. Yeah, That's, uh, <laughs> yeah totally, totally. <laughs> and, and for those of you, you know, can't see Hawk. He's uh, six foot five and yeah. about two hundred and change. So yeah. <laughs> he's a big dude. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, so it was it was different because I knew. Right from wrong, and I knew what you it had was. a Christian up upbringing. A Christian, strong Christian upbringing, uh, very pro-black. And when you say pro-black, people mean people say, "Well, are you anti-white?" I always ask if you see a person with a "kiss me" um, Irish shirt. Do you ask them if they hate Italians? Like, right, no. Right. So, you know, every time you assert your rights as a black person, you have to apologize in a way. And mm -hmm. you know, we're a yeah. long way past apologizing. Like, yeah. this is what it is. We're fighting for our rights. That doesn't mean we hate you, but this is 500 years of oppression we're dealing with. So high school, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to hang out. I wanted to be part of everything that was happening. So I veered away from my parents' teachings and I dropped out of high school. My saving grace, God, of course, but I played basketball. Mm. So instead of just hanging out all the time, I would just find a gym that was open in the daytime. And mm. go there and play basketball. I played with guys like Ron Artest, Meta World Peace, wow. uh, Elton Brand. Wow. I used to travel. They would come. To, those are to, those are top NBA players. If for those of you who don't know about the NBA, <laughs> yeah, like all stars. Yeah. And um, and they would come to games with like Junior Olympic sweatsuits. They would travel in the world. I was there with like pants hanging off my behind, yeah. Timberland, smelling yeah. like all kinds of herbs. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I just wouldn't get it right. So mm. uh, eventually, I, after I got into some trouble, I got back on track. You know. So in the environment you lived in, it was, was violent, it was rough, it was poor. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about the whole food injustice issue for a minute. Um, and what it was like growing up in that community. What kind of food there was or wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what your family ate, how... You know, your dad, you know, you mentioned has diabetes and mm -hmm. he died from that and yeah. had his legs amputated, which is... No, know. he actually, um, my dad had, he died on his seventh heart attack. Seventh heart attack, okay. Yeah, he had quadruple bypass, diverticulitis, you name it, Yeah, he had it. Yeah. And um, he, he was a smoker. He ate pretty much what he wanted to eat, but 
you have to look at it from the perspective of people who are living in these conditions. You have $20. It's one or two days before payday. It's a family of four. McDonald's has this dollar menu. That means you could get about eight burgers, four orders of fries for $12. Yeah. You know, it, it, it makes sense economically. Uh, we didn't know what clean eating was. After his first uh, heart attack, and then we made a shift. It was, it was a lot of chicken, baked. It was, you know, vegetables. But after a second heart attack, we kind of gave up. He's, he's like, oh, this doesn't work. I'm not going to eat this stuff. Exactly, <laughs> right? And um, there was, there was, he, he gave up, but then he couldn't work anymore. So we were, like, super poor. And my parents would buy me whatever I wanted. I was kind of like spoiled because they didn't want me to feel like I had to sell drugs. So they would miss rent sometimes to mm-hmm. pay for it. My mother carried the high school, carried mm-hmm. the family. She was, she was extraordinary in her strength. But we always ate bad food. It was to the point like before my dad died, I would bring them healthy food and they would look at it like, I'm not eating that. Why would I eat that? So not only is healthy food not available, but the majority of us look at it like it's disgusting. Right. I work with young adults now who won't drink water. Yeah. Soda. You know? Soda. It's yeah. just soda all the way. And, and, and this one person, she works with us. She's actually a victim. Um, she has a family of about six. And she doesn't drink water. So her kids aren't drinking water. Yeah. But well, I, you can get, you know, on food stamps, you can get two bottles for, of two liters of soda for $3. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's, it's good. Right? It, it's sweet. Everybody's happy. <laughs> it, 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 it just it's is. It's a different it form is. of crack. It is. It's like a new crack epidemic, really. It is. It is. And then Chinese food. That's health food to us. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> we don't know any better. So it mostly like packaged or processed or mm-hmm. starchy foods, soda, sugar. Yeah, all the time. Like you think about. Vegetables not happening. Vegetables rarely Right, rarely, but if if they are cooked, there's a lot of butter, there's a lot of salt. You know, it might lose its, its value. The fish is usually fried. Most yeah. of our foods are fried, deep fried. Yeah, yeah, deep fried. And um, we just don't know. Yeah, like we just don't know how to eat healthy. And and if we choose to, there there aren't that many options. We you struggle them. with this too. I mean, you recently dropped like thirty. 40 yeah. pounds, right? With the help of your son, Misha. All right, Misha, the <laughs> yeah. Health Warrior Project. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he teaches people about food, how to cook. And and what was that like switching over for you? Because this has been, you know, you, you've been fighting for justice and human rights and civil rights. And and yet, you know, you were in some way, you know, I met with Bernice King years ago. Mm-hmm. And she said, you know, nonviolence also means nonviolence to yourself. Amen. And I think, you know, a lot of people who are poor or minorities, it's sort of like an internalized sense of sort of racism because they 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 don't realize what's happening they don't realize the way the food system is driving their behavior is targeting them deliberately uh in ways that that are getting them to try to use more of their products um and so how how is that for you to switch over and change your diet uh it's hard because everything that you grew up eating even the things that you believe were good are now bad so like, it's like uh, I don't know, fried fish. <laughs> yeah, you right. know, like, it's oh, fish. Eating fish. What are you talking about, right? right? And a macaroni and cheese. Somehow I had it in my <clears> mind that, that was, that was actually food. healthy. <laughs> it was so I mean, it wasn't deep fried. Yeah, but it was just like all this cheese. And I had, yeah. actually, I have cheat days. I had some yesterday. Yeah. But, um, but like <laughs> oxtails, right? And like these meats and, and, and really salty meats like bacon and, and, and just the way we consume and digest food, it, it's just wrong. So for me, at first I just stopped eating, okay? Until I figured out what I could eat, I would just I would just not really eat. And I'm so busy. So when I did eat, it would be late in the day. Luckily, I married a vegetarian. Yeah. So my favorite meal now is like roast vegetables with there seasoning, you, you know? They're kind of sweet when you roast them. Oh, my God, yeah. And, uh, but it and took a while for your taste buds to switch over, right? It did. It did. And it's it coffee, mm. you know, coffee, caramel lattes, caramel macchiatos. Yeah. Well, they, Just, those have about five, 700 calories in them. Yeah. And I was doing three a day. And there's sugar, basically. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that, I think coffee was the hardest thing, but just really realizing, okay, here's what I can eat. Here's what I can't eat. That's something I still struggle with. Look at me. I'm 
you know, my parents were very educated, even though they just graduated from high school. They were self-educated for the most part. Mm -hmm. I went to law school. My sister went to the best universities in the country. And we are uneducated as to what we should eat. Mm -hmm. So what does that say for the people who really don't know? Yeah, it's just why I'm I'm happy that we're working together now to hopefully bring that message to. Yeah, the we're gonna people. talk about that in a minute. This new project yeah. in the Bronx, rejuvenation, to sort of transform the food system. It's so key, you know. But I think that people don't realize that there are s massive health disparities. Mm -hmm. It's like the third world in America. I mean, infant mortality in African American communities is twice that of white communities. If you look at, you know, diabetes, you know, we're you know eighty percent more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes if you're African American. You are four times likely to have um, kidney failure, three and a half times more likely to get your uh, legs amputated mm -hmm. because of diabetes. My you, dad had kidney failure. He yeah. was on dialysis for like seven years. Right, and so yeah. this is massive. And, you know, in some ways, uh, th there's a sense in the general culture of sort of blaming the victim. But mm -hmm. the whole system of food is set up in a way that actually is driving these behaviors. And I, what I've been sort of struck by is a lack of, understanding that this is just another form of oppression that, you know, big food and the targeted food marketing and the lack of access to food and the way in which even food stamps, you know, are used primarily for junk food and soda. So Absolutely. how does this black community think about this issue? Is there any awareness? Is there any consciousness that the man is really targeting you? Yeah. And like cigarettes, like targeting kids, like, you know, Joe Camel targeting kids for smoking. It's mm -hmm. the same thing that's happening. And people think, oh, this is their personal choice. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 unbelievable because I, I still live in the Bronx, and I'll go into the store, and all you hear is chopped cheese, right? Chopped yeah. cheese is like all this fried greasy meat with a bunch of grease and food, and 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 it's and, like a Bronx cheese. Bronx version of a chili, Philly cheesesteak. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, you know these things. So like, and um, you know, and that's what people are spending money on, and it's soda, but I would call it a silent killer, right? Mm -hmm. This would be, in my opinion, this is this is more targeted than keeping people out of jobs, keeping people out of schools, uh, because no one really knows about it. Yeah. Because we've been trained to believe that it is our choice. So when you told me like these food companies are intentionally getting people addicted to these foods, yeah. it kind of changed my life's path. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, the, I never realized it. I'm fighting yeah. against police brutality every day, against racism in, in different forms every day. But that was a light bulb. It was, it it's was like an invisible form of racism. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's so easy because people, one, aren't talking about it. The institutions that we would expect to protect us from yeah. this injustice already bought and paid for. Yeah. So who do we turn to? It's true. You know, I, I, uh, like I said, I was in Atlanta with Bernice King, and we were going to show the movie Fed Up about sugar and the food industry at the King Center. And I got a call that we couldn't show the movie because Coca-Cola funds the King Center. I met with the Dean of Spelman College, which is an all-women's um, African-American college Prominent. in Atlanta. It's yeah. like one of the top you know, colleges in the country. And she said half, half of the 18-year-old freshman class mm -hmm. of women had a chronic disease, Jeez. diabetes, right. obesity, hypertension. And yet all over campus was Coke machines. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is that? She says, well, because Coca-Cola is a big, huge sponsor and donor to Spelman College and all the other African-American colleges. The NAACP and the Hispanic Federation are donated money by Coca-Cola, so they will oppose the soda tax. So it's, it's a very insidious process. In fact, I, I met with a guy who was a New York Times reporter mm -hmm. who was an investigative journalist and, and got through FOIA, which is the Freedom of Information Act, of course. emails that Coca-Cola executives were sending to professors at a university, it was a public university, that's how they could get them, that they had a, a very targeted strategy that was very deliberate, bullet points of mm -hmm. how to target minorities and the poor and how to increase their utilization of their products. And it's, you know, it's, it's, we think it's, oh, it's an accident. Oh, they made these things. We really know. They know mm -hmm. and they're doing it on purpose. And it's, you know, that kind of makes me mad. I think, how do we get people mad about it? Like black mm -hmm. health matters, you know? Yeah. And you know what's interesting, right? I got to let you know, I am 
constantly walking around with a target on my back. Not one that, that would make, put me in fear of violence, even though there are threats. But you are walking into the terror dome. You are Mad Max right now. You have to understand, like, when we embark on this journey, they are going to come at you with yeah. everything. Because we're talking about hundreds of millions, maybe even billions, billions of dollars. Billions. Right? It's a, it's a multi, in America alone, the food industry is a trillion dollar industry. Jesus Christ. And we're going to disrupt this industry. I yeah. enjoy being a disruptor. That's yeah. my thing. But, you know, it's fascinating. Yeah. I think there's a consciousness that the... The gig is up and they're trying to shift. I had dinner with the president of Nestle's this week mm -hmm. and he was explaining to me the kinds of things they're trying to do to shift their products. Right. And they're the biggest food company in the world. Now they have a bad reputation. They basically got babies hooked on formula, formula's watered down, all these babies were malnourished and mm -hmm. die. They're selling Jesus all kinds Christ. of junk and crap, but they divested of all their candy business. So no more Nestle's crunch. And they basically are looking at buying up all these health food companies and they're working in Congress and to, to change the, the farm bill, to create more regenerative agriculture. It's fascinating what's happening behind the scenes. And so, you know, we're in, a, in an interesting moment where everybody's sort of waking up to this idea. But to me, it seems like, you know, the Hispanic and African-American communities are the ones that are suffering most from diabetes and obesity and chronic disease. They have poor, I mean, if you're African-American, you have five years less life expectancy than someone who's white in the country, in the same country. Absolutely. And, and so people are, are starting to sort of think about this differently. And I, I wonder how do we, you know, bring this to your communities in, in the Bronx and these poor communities around the country in a way to get them to be aware of what's happening and and to be sort of rising up against the injustice of what's happening. How how do we do that? I believe that the program we spoke about was is is the way to do it. It's the vehicle, right? Because so it's, you're talking about something called rejuvenation. Rejuvenation. So tell us about that. It's rejuve hyphen nation, ah. and the concept is. We are breathing life back into a deflated people. You think about when, when you know, they zap people and say clear, and then, you know, they try to yeah, pump yeah. life. This is what we're doing. So we're actually giving life back to people. The, at, the, at the end result, at the outcome, we are looking at changing history. You and I. You and I. Down with that. Right? We are changing <laughs> history. We're working with Health Warrior Project so they can understand how to prepare this food. How to cook how to cook, how to cook clean, and also how to, we're going to give them food while they're there. They'll cook their own food, and then they'll leave with the bag of groceries. So to bring you back to when I said there's $20 left in two days before the paycheck, yeah. they won't have any other choice but to eat that food. Right, right. right. Yeah, and yeah. then hopefully it'll become part of their diet. So along with rejuvenation, we're teaching people personal organizational skills. Okay, and meditation, mindfulness practice. It's all about wellness. It's holistic. And for me, I don't have to tell you the message of Black Lives Matter if I teach you how to love yourself. Yeah. Because if you love yourself, you won't be a doormat for anyone and you'll stand up for yourself consistently. So the bottom line is we're going to go in, teach people how to eat. We're starting out in the Bronx and hopefully it'll grow and change, you know, Tupac. Yeah. Tupac, people undervalue Tupac. Tupac's he wrote about he he sung about this yes. about the food system and what it's doing to the communities and yeah he was ahead of his time. Yeah. He was raised by Panthers. See, I'm telling oh. you, it all <laughs> it all comes full circle. And uh, he 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 talked about this, and this is what we have to do. So yes, I'll be pushing for le legislature, but food injustice, like you changed my life. You really changed my life. This is the there way was this, I to mean, go. even though you're leading the activist movement, even though you're, you went to law school, you're educated, this was like a, a big realization for you. Yeah, it was a light bulb moment. It was the invisible bully, right? Silent killer. Because right. I, I mean, always, yeah, I say this, you know, 1.3 deaths or percent are caused by gun violence, mm -hmm. including suicide. But there's literally millions of people that are dying from bad food. That's it. <laughs> Kills more people than anybody else, anything else. And this is the message that we have to get out, right? So we're talking about a social media campaign and just really educating people. There's, there's, there's going to be this shift, this heart-centered mm -hmm. shift. I always talk about it. And people are just going to become really conscious. And you think really people want to change their diet? 
because people kind of attach to this is my food, yeah. this is my culture. You know, it's, I remember being on this rafting trip with this Hopi chief, mm -hmm. and it was to sort of deal with some of the water issues and the the the, the um, tar sands mining, which is going to destroy the Green River, it goes into Colorado River, and and it, it, he was very overweight. Uh, he had diabetes, and I said, you know, Howard, uh, you don't have to suffer like this. He said, you can mm -hmm. fix it. He said, what do I have to do? I said, well, you have to give up starch and sugar and soda and he was like, well, wow, I'm going to not, what are we going to do? Because um, we have our Hopi ceremonies and we mm -hmm. need to eat our ceremonial foods. And I said, well, what is that? He said, well, it's cookies and cakes and pies. I said, your Hopi ancestors are not having cookies and cakes. <laughs> this is not your traditional ceremonial foods, right? Absolutely. And yet it's, it, it's so internalized. He doesn't realize that it's not his culture, right? Absolutely. It's, sort yeah. of, it's been imposed on them. And it, same thing has happened in African-American communities. We hear about it. There are efforts out there to educate us, but we don't really see it as a realistic part of our day. If you're worried about keeping your lights on, yeah. uh, uh, paying your rent, you don't have time to worry about injustice, which is something I have to overcome. And at that point, you're just trying to buy whatever you can buy to feed your family. We would also need to look at making good food available to people. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not sure... I'm still learning how to shop. Yeah. You know, we have to, it, it has to be an intensive campaign. I love the thought of starting out in the Bronx because the Bronx is consistently the unhealthiest county in New York State. Yeah. So that's like ground zero for this. Yeah, it's like the third world right here in Manhattan, in Absolutely. New York, right? Absolutely. You can go to Park Avenue in the middle of the city and be in, you know, one of the most affluent countries in the world and I'm affluent Districts. Neighborhoods, yeah. districts in the world, and you could travel on that same street about three miles north, and you will encounter a hell. Yeah. And, and you know, it's still a community where people love each other, but there's garbage out front. Rats are playing in the garbage. There's kids walking in hallways. There's urination, defecation yeah. in the staircase. The yeah. Kids are walking past this urination in the elevator. And people are saying, well, how can they live like that? Because there's this prevailing culture where people just give don't up. have time to care or give up. So part of rejuvenation is organizing tenants to clean up the buildings. We'll put on suits and go and clean up these staircases. I have no problem doing Amazing. that. If we could just help people to improve their lives, their neighborhoods, then we're doing God's work. So, you know, you know you're also, we didn't talk about it much, but you're also the head of the New York chapter for Black Lives Matter. Right on. And, um, you know, a lot of people have issues with that movement mm -hmm. um, because they feel like it's, you know, all lives matter. And, you know, you yes. said something the other day that was really beautiful. You said, you know, all lives matter. Well, all lives will matter when black lives also matter. Right on. You know, it's not that not everybody matters. Yes, blue mm -hmm. lives matter, white lives matter, black lives matter, yellow lives matter, like, right? But at the end of the day, there's, there's real issues here and injustice, and we have to call them out. We have to address them. With rejuvenation and this project that I'm calling Common Ground, I think we'll be able to bring more people together because black lives matter is very polarizing. And some people won't get involved just because of the name. So you create this program called Common Ground where we are just taking the high ground. And I always well, like tell Michelle people. Like Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. We go high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right on. And, and he won the presidency with that, right? Like people were, that first election was, 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 was tough. Obama. Yeah. Obama. Yeah. yeah, it was tough, but he just took the high ground. He wouldn't mm. engage in the politics, which was beautiful. So common ground is us staying out of the weeds. It's us talking to Republicans, right? People who may not see things eye to eye and kind of saying, okay, we don't agree on everything. Here's what we agree on across the country. Let's fight for legislature to change this. Yeah. So um, last question. Mm -hmm. If you were king for a day, um, what would be the kind of policy or law or thing that you would do to change what's happening in your communities? I would. Imagine that, having all that power. Yeah, it's, all that power. it's humbling. It's hard. It is, it is humbling. I would give people land. Land? Land. 
the the homes that they live in. Okay, if this is your neighborhood, your so people have ownership of where they are. Have ownership of where you are, right? And with that land, you control the business. So you decide who you want to rent to and things like that. I respect the Jewish community so much. And and people don't like Jewish folks, right? And I think of that as not liking the Bulls when they had Michael Jordan. Right. You know, because they're the winning team, right? Yeah. They figured out how to establish their own neighborhoods, right, where they school their children, police their communities. It's safe. They have their own businesses, and it's a thriving community. However, a perfect example of this is us. They do business with everyone else. Yeah. It's a self-sustaining community. So if I could do anything for black people, I would put them in a position where they could be self-sustaining. If you look back through history, right, even though it didn't do much, the Jewish folks received reparations, right? Hiroshima, Japanese received a lot of aid. Yeah. The indigenous people, the Native, Native Americans, they're given land, they have their casinos. So it wasn't much. But it was something that was helpful yeah. that, that provided a foundation. Black people never received their There were no aid. reparations no after slavery, reparations. right? Yeah. yeah. So we were repeatedly victimized. You know, there was this economic oppression and now food oppression. So what would I do? I, I'd give folks land. Yeah, yeah, because people having a sense of ownership over their life mm -hmm. is really what allows them to stand up and to work and do the things that make their lives better. And I think... When you look at disease, mm -hmm. uh, the the biggest cause of chronic disease and death is not smoking, not even diet. It's the social determinants of health, and and particularly the sense of a loss of locus of control, mm -hmm. where you feel like you're out of control in your life, whether wow. it's your job or your community or whatever's going on. That sense of loss of control and empowerment is what actually makes people sick and die. And I think people don't realize that. And I think this is this is a you know, undoing, you know, centuries of, of beliefs, policies, behaviors. And there are people who break out like you, but it's tough. It and is. when the whole system is sort of set up in a way that doesn't support you, doesn't provide the ability to actually learn and to grow and to be empowered and to have access to the skills and tools and, you know, knowledge that allows them to lift themselves up, it's powerful. It's almost an impossibility. Yeah. This is why I love hanging out with you. <laughs> you always give me these these jewels. Like, oh, man, you're awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, Hawk. And uh, I can't wait to work in the Bronx with you That's and right change the food system there. And we have so many ways of actually using that to help illustrate how it can be done. And then you imagine tracking the levels of, of educational success or even... The, the social issues around poverty and violence. How, what happens when you start to change the communities and build that? Because that's what you're talking about. Is communities start to break down and, and they don't have the fabric that pulls everything together. And by having ownership and even starting with your own body, having ownership of your health. Because when you are sick, when you're mm -hmm. eating badly, when you are um, you know have a chronic disease, you can't work as well. You are not as productive. You can't think straight. You can't lift yourself up if you're oppressed by the food system. So Absolutely. I think for me, it's it's important to call it out. And mm -hmm. there's many, many issues, obviously, racial injustice, criminal um, justice system that's broken. I mean, there's all those issues that have to be dealt with. But in a way, I see this as one of those things that people can change and will change. And so I'm excited to work on that with you. Me too, brother. All I'm, right. I'm, I'm really thankful. Well, thanks for, for being on The mark. Doctor's Pharmacy. We'll stay tuned. Maybe have you back another time when we... We can talk about the whole program. Right on. Okay. Right on. We get some footage of us yeah. doing it in the streets. There you go. Right on. <laughs> Thank you, Hawk. Thank you, brother.